Look up the name Stan McKeady in any NHL record book, and beside it you'll see notations about the Hart Trophy, the Lady Bing Trophy, a Stanley Cup championship, a 22-year career. But to measure a man like Stan McKeady merely in terms of numbers, as we found out, is to miss the point just a little bit. Told a hundred times of making a hundred and one, tell me the story about coming over from Czechoslovakia and getting a foothold in life over here. Well, uh, I was adopted by my aunt and uncle uh, in, in the days when, when it was still communist, or at least communism was just coming into, into Czechoslovakia. And the only way I could get out was through adoption. So my mother, who was my uncle's uh, sister, uh, I guess they had a meeting and they, and they said that it would be the best thing for me. And also, I have a, a sister who lives in Toronto who was a very, very distant cousin of mine at that time. And she was also adopted with me. So two of us came out uh, in 1948. We uh, settled in St. Catharines, Ontario. I, uh, I spent 10 of my formative years were uh, in St. Catharines. That's where I learned how to play hockey. That's where I went to school and, and uh, high school. And uh, in 1958, I came up to Chicago. Uh, went back for a couple of years to St. Catharines in the off season, and I've been in Chicago ever since. I'll never forget the first time in the stadium. Uh, we, uh, I was called up as an 18-year-old kid out of junior hockey. Uh, Montreal's in town, and I'm sitting on the bench, middle of the first period. The coach tapped me, which was Rudy Pillis at the time, tapped me on the shoulder. He said, "Go and take this face off," which was on the in the Montreal end zone. And I said, "Who me?" He said, yeah, get, get the hell out there. So I jumped over the boards, uh, fell on my ass, because my, my legs were a little shaky. And uh, I get to the face-off circle and put my stick down, and I look up to see who I'm facing off against. And I just kept looking and looking and looking. <laughs> it happened to be John Belleville. Uh, at that time, I think I was about five foot eight. He's six foot five. Uh, so, you know, it was quite an imposing figure that I was looking at. And that was my first impression of hockey in Chicago. Stan was a very smooth player. You know, Bobby Hull will talk endlessly about Stan Nikita. Um, Stan, to me, is a gentleman. He was always so clean cut on the ice. And he had a lot of fire for quite a few years on the ice. And he, uh, he racked up a few penalty minutes for a a small centerman who, uh, who scored a lot. And uh, it's tough not to like a player like Stan. I think that a player like Stan, everybody in the league would want to play with. You were sort of uh, one of the last of, uh, of, in an era when guys would spend their entire career with one team. Uh, that, that, when you look back on it, is that amazing to you? Uh, it, it is, uh, but in those days it wasn't really that, uh, that tough. I think there were a lot of people, of course they didn't play 22 years, you know, 12 years with one team was, was a pretty good run. Uh, I was, uh, uh, maybe I was the oddity as far as uh, playing that long uh, with one team. And what about some of the great memories of those teams? Uh, we could probably do about an hour on that, but... Uh, sure, I'm sure we could. Yeah. Well, How uh, much we'll time do you have? <laughs> well, uh, my, you take my first line mates up here. Uh, the, uh, what, what they, well, actually, it wasn't called the scooter line then, but Ted Lindsay was my first left winger. Terrible player. And he's still terrible. He's, he's still competitive at age 68 or something. Uh, but my first real line that they called the scooters was uh, Kenny Warren from uh, North Bay uh, and Ab McDonald uh, from Winnipeg. Was that, was that an incredible era when you think back on it, how competitive it was? I mean, how you... Just the, the opponent was the opponent. There was no fraternizing. There was only six teams. You saw guys all the time. Um, well, a lot of uh, that, in, in those days, they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow you to fraternize, the owners. Uh, they wanted to keep you, uh, uh, I guess the word is mad at each other. So uh, they thought it would be better uh, entertainment for the people. Uh, tell me about the helmet. You were one of the first guys I can remember as a kid watching hockey to wear a helmet all the time. How did that come to be? And well, uh, because of a couple of uh, bad injuries that I had uh, to probably the most vital part of our body, our head, 
Uh, one, I got my ear cut off in Pittsburgh, but the helmet wouldn't have saved that anyway, but it, it, it would have made me turn a different way. Uh, the puck came up and hit me and, and, cl and clipped it off. Luckily, they sewed it back on. Uh, the other one was in, in Toronto, uh, a guy by the name of Kent Douglas, uh, back in the 60s. He uh, was a defenseman. He used the thickest handled stick I've ever seen in my life. It was like a two-by-four. Anyway, he gave me a two-hander one time. I saw it coming right between my eyes, so I put my head down, they nailed me up here, you can still see the scar. He, he obviously uh, uh, was a great player. Uh, when, when you can be one of the leading penalty minute leaders and then come back and uh, change your whole game and your whole style and uh, win a championship in Chicago, he was one of the best players to play the game. Tell me about the, uh, the famous banana blade. How did that come to be? As, as uh, all or most great inventions, it was by accident. Really? Uh, the stick happened to break in the middle of the blade uh, while I was practicing, but it didn't, it just cracked on the back of it. It didn't break all the way through. Uh, so part of the lamination was cracked. Anyway, it, it stayed in the, in the bent position and I said, no, I've only got one stick up here. We've got about 15 minutes of practice left. So uh, as I was leaving the ice, I, I kind of I saw a puck sitting in there. I slammed it against the boards and it was a different feel than I've ever had before of the, of the puck leaving the stick. And the stick still didn't break. So after we finished practice, I, I started thinking about it and eventually started bending the sticks myself. And uh, we broke a few of them in the, in the uh, transition of trying to figure out how to do this. Eventually, uh, we, we learn how to do it, and of course, they make them that, that way now. And Stan, we don't all get a chance to, uh, to write our own uh, epitaph, so to speak, but when you look back in your career, right, if you were writing it, what would you like people to, to know about, about Stan Makita, the player? What would you like to be the lasting impression? I didn't realize I was gonna leave so early this, from this earth, but, uh, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, I'll never forget what my father told me when I, when I first got over to uh, the Canada, and, and I try to live that philosophy, and hopefully I've lived it. He said, whatever you do, try to do your best. He said, some days it's not going to be worth a damn, but at least you gave it your best shot. And, and I've tried to follow that philosophy, and uh, today might not be my best day, but if I'm around tomorrow, I'm still going to give it a shot, and hopefully tomorrow will be better.